Star Trek Deep Space Nine was never as highly rated as its predecessor, Star Trek The Next Generation, or as much a part of the public consciousness as the original series. Moreover, unlike every other Star Trek television series, Deep Space Nine was set aboard a space station, which had some fans wonder what the word Trek was doing in the title. That unchanging location, however, only proved to be an asset to the program, which unlike its predecessors, had no choice but to live with the consequences of each episode, because there wasn't another planet to zip off to the following week. In recent years, the series has become the subject of a critical reappraisal. Those willing to accept Star Trek Deep Space Nine on its own terms will find what Entertainment Weekly has called the Trek franchise's most compelling series. And with that in mind, my name is Ori, this is What Culture, and these are the 10 best episodes on Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Number 10, The Siege of AR-558. Summary, on a routine supply run to AR-558, the Defiant discovers the Starfleet garrison there has been decimated by endless Jem'Hadar attacks, with less than a third of their original number still alive and morale low. AR-558 is important because a Dominion communications array has been discovered there. If Starfleet engineers can figure out how it works, it means they'll be able to tap into the enemy's entire communication system. When the Defiant is forced to leave, Cisco and a few others elect to stay. A massive Jem'Hadar attack is coming and they're going to help hold the position until Starfleet can send reinforcements. Why this episode is great? The argument made by this episode is a familiar one. After more than a year of open warfare between most of the Alpha Quadrant powers and the Dominion, it's an argument that needed to be made. War is hell. Up until this episode, the war had been dramatized mostly in terms of ship battles, which never shied away from showing massive casualties. Those casualties, however, were often abstract and impersonal. But the war isn't abstract or impersonal on AR-558. The men and women stationed there have been holding the lifeless rock for months without reinforcement. For them, war is a nasty, dirty business that wears you down day after day with no end in sight. And if you let misery get to you, even if only for a second, you will end up dead. But if you don't, there's no guarantee that you'll live to see tomorrow. The episode ends with Cisco reading the weekly casualty report. He reminds himself that it's not just a list of names. Every one of them was a person. And it's important to remember that. Number nine, The Visitor, season four. Summary, a freak accident happens to take Captain Benjamin Sisko's life in the Defiance engine room, right in front of his son, Jake. Later, it becomes clear that Sisko wasn't killed at all, but has become unstuck in time. Every few weeks, months or years, the interval increases each time, the captain reappears for a few moments in his son's life before vanishing again without a trace. For the captain, the accident just happened. For Jake, an entire lifetime eventually passes by. Jake tries to lead a normal life, marrying and achieving his dream of becoming a writer. Why it's great? The Visitor is a great episode not because of the complicated sci-fi plot, but because of the relationship between Benjamin Sisko and his son Jake. Their bond is in many ways at the core of the series and it is never better explored than in this episode. In lesser hands, the premise could become sentimental or manipulative. But as written by Michael Taylor, directed by David Livingston, and acted by Siroc Lofton and Tony Todd, the episode just works on every level. The ending, in which an aged Jake decides to sacrifice his own life to give his father a chance to avoid the entire accident in the first place, makes a poignant and tragic end to an hour that is routinely cited as one of the best of the series. Number 8, Homefront, Paradise Lost, Season 4. Summary, Cisco is recalled to Earth after a terrorist bombing reveals that the changelings have reached Earth. Odo accompanies him to help Starfleet security beef up their anti-changeling security measures. When the global power grid goes down, all evidence points to changeling sabotage and the Federation presidents declare a state of emergency. Fearing an all-out Dominion assault, Cisco recommends that the president tighten security measures. The president does, and Starfleet troops are deployed across the planet. However, Cisco begins to suspect that the power outage wasn't changeling sabotage at all, but the work of a militant faction of Starfleet that wants to overthrow the civilian government and install a military dictatorship. Why it's great? The threat of changeling infiltration is a storyline that continues to resonate, perhaps even more relevant today than when Deep Space Nine first aired. 
What's great about these two episodes, however, is not that it dramatizes the threat of an enemy that could blend into any environment in an instant, but that it identifies our fear of that threat as an even greater enemy. As a changeling posing as O'Brien tells Captain Sisko on Earth, in the end, it's your fear that will destroy you. In the end, Sisko talks the conspirators down and proves the Changeling wrong. But the fact that what the Changeling predicted came so close to happening is as frightening as the threat of the Dominion itself. Number 7. The Way of the Warrior Season 4 Summary The station is swarming with Klingons who have arrived to help Starfleet fight the Dominion, but they have been causing trouble, searching ships without warrants and roughing up the station's Cardassian tailor Garrick. Sisko calls in one Starfleet officer with the most experience dealing with the Klingons, the son of Moog himself, Star Trek The Next Generation's Worf. Why this episode's great? The Way of the Warrior features the biggest action set pieces ever to be depicted on Deep Space Nine up to that point. But even if these scenes were removed, it would be notable for one thing, bringing Worf into the fold. As the gruff Klingon security chief, Worf, Michael Dorn was a strong member of the ensemble on Star Trek The Next Generation. But on Star Trek Deep Space Nine, his character really came into his own. It's evident from their very first scenes together that Dorn had strong chemistry with Terry Farrell, who played Jadzia Dax, which the writers did not anticipate, but would use to their full advantage as the series progressed. Number 6. Rocks and Shoals Season 6 Summary Sisko and his crew crash land their stolen Jem'Hadar ship on an alien planet and soon discover that a group of Jem'Hadar has also crash landed there and only have one vial of Ketracel White, a narcotic that turns them into fiercely loyal warriors but will put them in raging juicing withdrawals if they don't get their daily dose. At the same time as this conflict is unfolding, Kira works side by side with the Dominion on the station and finds that she can no longer lead her life as a collaborator. Why it's great? The first six episodes of the sixth season of DS9 told a tightly serialized arc, which was a narrative experimental for the Star Trek franchise, but one that would pay off in dividends. By my estimation, at least four of these episodes are among the best the series ever made, but the best of the bunch is Rocks and Shoals. Philip Morris may be best known for his work as Jackie Charles on Seinfeld, but in his role as a Jemadar leader, Ramata Klan, he shows that his dramatic chops are just as excellent. His performance, along with the stark cinematography of the bleak rock quarry location, make the Jemadar's final suicide attack one of the most memorable and tragic sequences in the series. The most powerful moment in the episode, however, comes from Kira's storyline aboard the station, when her complacency is interrupted by the public suicide of a Bajoran Vedek, who hangs herself in front of Kira and dozens of others on the promenade. It remains a truly shocking moment. Number 5. Call to Arms Season 5 Summary The episode opens with the revelation that the Romulans have signed a non-aggression pact with the Dominion, which leads Starfleet to order Sisko to stop further Dominion reinforcements from reaching Cardassia by blocking the entrance to the wormhole with a minefield. As the Dominion fleet approaches, Sisko orders an emergency evacuation of the station. Klingon forces remain to defend the position until the Defiant can finish laying the minefield. When it is finally completed, Sisko and the Klingons flee and Kira welcomes the Dominion and Cardassians aboard Deep Space Nine. The Dominion War has begun. Why this episode's great? The Dominion threat had been brewing since the end of the second season and a call to arms finally makes good on that promise, beginning the show's strongest arc which would be carried through to the series finale. Any number of moments in the episode, Sisko leaving his baseball, the image of the Defiant joining a larger force of Starfleet vessels than we have ever seen would make it a memorable installment. The cliffhanger, which involves Captain Sisko losing Deep Space Nine, the show's namesake, is the best dramatic hook the show ever offered. Number four, Trials and Tribble Asians, season five. Summary. On board the station, Captain Sisko is being questioned by two agents from the Department of Temporal Investigations. The Defiant was recently sent back in time by a Klingon posing as a human merchant who sent the vessel back to Deep Space Station K7 to relive the events of the original series episode, The Trouble with Tribbles. Why it's great? The most expensive episode of the entire fifth season is also a loving tribute to the original series, all the way down to the blinking lights on the Enterprise Bridge, which were meticulously studied frame by frame to get them exact. For the 30th anniversary of the premiere of Star Trek on NBC, 
which was September the 8th, 1966, the producers of Star Trek Deep Space Nine came up with an ingenious way to honor the long history of the franchise. Why not use new digital technology to insert Cisco and company into an episode of the original series? It would be impossible for fans of the original series not to smile as O'Brien and Bashir stand in the lineup in front of Kirk after the bar fight, or as Cisco and Dax pelt tribbles onto Kirk from the storage unit above but perhaps the most amusing moment comes when an embarrassed Worf confesses about the Klingons' different appearance in the mid-23rd century. With a statement said in true Worf fashion, it is a long story. We do not discuss it with outsiders. Number three, Duet, season one. Summary. When a Cardassian man arrives on Deep Space Nine, suffering from an illness he could have only contracted at a Bajoran labor camp during the occupation, Major Kieran Arif superheads an investigation to determine if he is a notorious war criminal responsible for the deaths of countless Bajorans. Why it's great? It's a testament to the quality of the writing, acting and directing on Deep Space Nine that an episode like Duet works at all. After all, the production didn't set out to make one of the best episodes of the series or to provide Nana Visitor with an episode that defined an already well-written character. They set out to balance the season's bloated production budget. The series needed an episode that could be shot on standing sets with a minimum of guest stars and as few visual effects as possible. The result was Duet, an episode which takes place almost exclusively in one room, has only two major characters and contains almost no action and yet duet is easily the most compelling episode of the show's entire first season it's not just a great episode of star trek deep space nine it's a great episode of star trek period number two far beyond the stars season six summary in a decidedly off format episode cisco experiences a vision from the prophets which recasts him as benny russell a science fiction writer in the 1950s who struggles with civil rights and inequality as he writes the story of Captain Benjamin Sisko, a black commander of a futuristic space station known as Deep Space Nine. Why it's great? Until Star Trek Discovery, Deep Space Nine was the only Star Trek television series with a non-white lead. In the 1990s, it was one of the only few shows on television starring a black man. For the most part, this was unremarked upon, a silent but important truth, and one that Avery Brooks has said convinced him to stick with the series early on. Far Beyond the Stars, however, deals with race head on by recasting Brooks as Benny Russell, a science fiction writer living in New York in 1953. In various roles and out of makeup, the rest of the cast appears as different characters as well. When the magazine does their annual star photograph, Russell, as well as Kay Eaton, who writes under the gender neutral pseudonym KC Hunter, are gently reminded to sleep in that day. You see, the readers don't know that the magazine has black and women writers, and the editor would like to keep it that way. In lesser hands, this episode could become polemic or a two-dimensional melodrama, but in the hands of writers Iris Stephen Bear, Hans Beimler, and Mark Scott Zickrey, not to mention Avery Brooks, who directed it, it avoids those pitfalls and becomes something greater. The episode's final shot, in which Cisco sees Benny as his reflection, marks the perfect ending to a terrific hour. And number one, In the Pale Moonlight, season six, summary. Cisco is at his wit's end over the losses the Federation is taking to the Dominion. If something doesn't change soon, it's possible they could lose the war. When Beta Z is invaded, Cisco decides that it's up to him to bring about that change himself, and he and Lys Garrick to persuade the Romulans to abandon their non-aggression pact with the Dominion and join the war on the Federation side. He soon learns, however, that to accomplish his goals, he'll have to abandon his Federation principles. Why it's so great. In the Pale Moonlight has been called the darkest episode of Star Trek ever produced. Maybe that's true. I don't really know. What I do know is that from top to bottom, it's a great episode of television. It's an essential part of the ongoing arc of the Dominion War. It allows Cisco to wrangle with a fantastic ethical dilemma. Is he willing to commit unjust actions to achieve his goal of bringing the Romulans into the war, which he views as both just and necessary? And it's an actor's showcase for both Avery Brooks as Cisco and Andrew Robertson as Garrick, who have nothing but magnificent scenes together. From beginning to end, it commands the audience his attention, particularly the monologues to camera, making the audience feel in direct conversation with Captain Benjamin Sisko. And for my money, it's the best episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And there you have it, my top 10 Star Trek Deep Space Nine episodes. Are there any that I missed off my list that you thought should have been on there? Let me know in the comments below. 
And don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel for more great content. My name is Ori with an A. This is What Culture, and I'll see you next time.